All right, we are live. All right, Chip, if you can, um, for the people who don't know who you are, kind of give us a brief introduction about who you are, what you do, and why you're here talking to me about night vision. Well, thanks for having me, Colin. Yes, um, so I've got a background in special operations, and uh, after that, I worked for TNBC for a while, and I'm now at Unity Tactical, uh, where I run business development, uh, sales, a lot of our marketing and product demos. Um, but I'm also the lead instructor still for TNBC's night fighter classes that we basically go around the country and, and teach. So we've got civilian open enrollment classes. We do law enforcement and military classes as well. Gotcha. So for someone, I'm I'm generally pretty new. I'm a new when it comes to night vision. And so I, you and I had already talked before. And so I was like, you know what? You'd be great to come onto the podcast and talk to people who were like me, didn't know much about night vision, but are, you know, intrigued about it. And, um, and, you know, considering everything that's going on, you know, they're starting to look towards getting into night vision. So for the people who are new to this, what would be kind of a starting point in terms of getting it from beyond listening to this podcast? Uh, what would be a good starting point for them to kind of delve into the world of night vision and, and some of the things that they should expect or look for? That was an extremely loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that is. Um, all right, let's try and break it down. Right. Um, so there's two types of night vision devices. You've got image intensification, which is kind of the uh, traditional green or now white screens that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and image intensification is really great for identification purposes, not going to be as great for detection purposes because you're basically looking at the world through a single palette, uh, color palette, which uh, means that essentially the same camouflage that's going to work for someone during the day uh, is going to work just as well, mm -hmm. if not better at night. Um, then the other part of night vision is thermal which basically um, senses infrared energy. And everything in the world puts off infrared energy, whether it's man-made, alive, dead, whatever. Um, so the things that are hotter are going to put off more infrared energy, and then that's what the thermal is going to detect. So thermal is that, uh, you know, kind of the predator vision, if you will, mm -hmm. and that's essentially going to uh, be great for detection, but it's not going to be as good at identification. So, you know... The professionals basically use both in conjunction. So you've got detection and identification capabilities. Mm, so, so that's how starting, Arnold was able to survive. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought you know, about well, that. The, the, the best equipment out there, unfortunately, <laughs> it uh, it costs money. You, yeah. you, you do have to pay to play. And uh, one of the things I tell my students, um, night vision, well, the, the night vision world, I should say, is one of the only facets of, defense technology, individual warfighter defense technology, mm -hmm. where your gear literally uh, dictates your capabilities. So, I mean, you can give uh, an operator really crappy, you know, turn of the century gear, mm -hmm. and they're still going to do work, but give them the best gear, and they're going to make magic happen. Gotcha. So, starting out with image intensification is usually what I recommend to most people. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it's really going to depend on what your purpose is. You know, if you're a hunter and you just want to go out and, uh, and shoot hogs or coyotes that are maybe on your land, uh, you know, because down south especially, it's a huge problem. Yeah. I mean, agricultural losses in Texas alone, I believe, are close to a billion dollars yeah, annually. Nuts. It's nuts, man. So it's really nuts. It is absolutely insane. So, so many people are buying night vision and thermal and all that just to go out and keep their, their livelihood, keep their farms up and running, um, keep their, their cattle and their sheep and things like that from getting picked off by, uh, by coyotes. And then, of course, you've got the home defense side of things. So I tend to direct more people to uh, image intensification mm -hmm. uh, before getting into thermal. It's generally, you're, you're going to get more uh, for... I, I hesitate to say cheaper price because it's still not cheap, but you're going to get more capability out of, say, a PVS-14 Gen 3 monocular mm -hmm. um, for the cost of that than you will taking that same money and trying to throw it at thermal uh, because the, the thermal device you're going to get for that same cost is, in my opinion, not going to be nearly as capable. Okay. So, because I've always wondered about that, you know, should I get thermal? Should I get night vision? You call it image intensification, correct? 
that's that's night vision or or they all oh, both night vision and then oh go ahead that i i'll usually call it i squared uh okay. for image intensification um just because referring to night like referring to anything as night vision is kind of like calling a tissue kleenex you know it's <laughs> It's technically okay. not wrong, but it's also not technically correct. It's, it's, it's overly correct in a way, I guess, in a way. It's like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so image squared would be the, see, I'm still, I'm still at a loss. So we have therm, we have thermal and then we have, what's the other one? It, image intensification. Okay. Image intensification. Which is what most people just call night vision. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now the thermal is always, or the thermal for me was always the one that looked the coolest because you know all the colors and all yep. that stuff like that, and of course Predator, and you know. Um, but by and large, I, I, I did come to the conclusion that and, you know after you and I talked, pretty much image intensification is probably going to be the best way to go for me. Um, yep. So the thing that really kind of set me back was like you kind of touched on it a little bit was the price of image Indeed. intensification. Can I, I'm, I'm just going to say night vision for the sake of conversation. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's expensive. It's really expensive. And so, but there, I think there is the kind of, there is a kind of a sweet spot though, right? Um, for someone such as myself looking to get into night vision, what would be to you, if you were going to talk to someone like me, kind of the way you talk to me, um, what should I look realistically look to be spending on night vision where I like, what's the, the lowest amount I really should be spending. Um, so as to avoid not having any regrets once I get it. That is always the, the big question. Cause budget's going to drive that gear train. Yeah. And there's a lot of cheap night vision out there. Um, you know, a lot of foreign manufacturers who sell stuff. I mean, hell you can go on Walmart's website and find night vision. You can go buy it over the counter at, uh, any of the big box outdoors stores. Um, but it's not going to necessarily be the same thing that warfighters are going outside the wire with every night. And there is a big difference. And, you know, you can't just say that, oh, a PVS-14 is a PVS-14 is a PVS-14. So I'll start there. What is okay. a PVS-14? Yeah. A PVS-14 is the current standard issue night vision monocular or goggle, if you will. I, I personally tend to refer to anything that goes on the head as a goggle. Mm -hmm. um, so a monocular in this case, the, uh, the 14 is going to be the standard issue for all infantry units within the U S military's general purpose forces. Uh, most special operations units are going to be using at least dual tubes. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, that's a lot of budget to be throwing at, um, you know, it putting every warfighter, every gunfighter in the U S military, let alone all the NATO forces as well into dual tube goggles. So the PBS-14 is essentially going to be made up of the housing, the optics, uh, front and rear, and then the image tube. And like I alluded to before, just because it's called the PBS-14 doesn't make it the same exact thing that the warfighters are getting issued. Because you could put Gen uh, 2 tubes in there, you could put uh, Gen 3 tubes, um, and then there's various levels because there is a mil spec. And not all image tubes are created equal because it's not a manufacturing process where it's like an assembly line um, uh, where every single one's going to come out exactly the same. So today's... Wait, why is that? Well, because essentially parts of it are grown. You can't necessarily you like say that it's all built, you know... Like, uh, you mean like grown, you mean like grown like, 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 like a plant? <laughs> Uh, kind of like grown in a petri dish, you know, okay. in a way. Okay. Okay. Um, so, like the phosphor screen, for example. Mm. So, the an image intensification tube has three main parts. The front is the photocathode, the center is the microchannel plate, and uh, the the back is going to be the phosphor screen. Okay. So, the way it's working is um, photons, light energy, goes through the photocathode, which converts into a or electron uh, electronic energy. The electrons then bounce through the microchannel plate, which is a wafer-thin piece of glass, for the sake of conversation, with all these tiny microscopic holes. So, uh, but to a subatomic particle like an electron, mm -hmm. um, those holes are like hallways. So, picture throwing a tennis ball down a hallway and it's bouncing, you know, hitting every wall and hitting other tennis balls. Every time it impacts uh, a surface or another electron, it multiplies. Mm -hmm. So you get millions and millions and millions more electrons coming out the back than what went in the front. 
those then splash up on the phosphor screen, which is the part that's grown. Um, and actually, technically, so is the, the microchannel plate um, to a degree. And uh, that then turns them back into photons. But now there's way more photons uh, than what went in the front. And then that's what your eye sees. So that's the amplified image. And because uh, you, know, you, you can control it only to a degree, you're going to get some image tubes that pass the mil spec that are within that that mil spec mm -hmm. you're going to get some that far surpass it others that don't make the cut um, but it's still costing the manufacturer of those tubes the same amount of money to make you know all those tubes so they're still going to sell them and recoup the money and that's why you're going to find some image tubes that are going to underperform or overperform others okay and that's where you're going to see a pretty big price differential Mm, okay. And so, so let's say I had, I don't know, 2000, could I get a decent set or one, uh, two tube or two tubes? Uh, like where, <laughs> where, where, where am I living in that regard? Maybe, um, <laughs> it depends on what, you know, I always tell people buy the best that your money can afford. Mm. You know, like for me, I don't scrimp on my gun stuff. And when I say gun stuff, that's going to include gear, night vision, you know, training, any of that kind of stuff. I don't skimp on tr uh, stuff for my truck. Mm -hmm. And I don't skimp on stuff for uh, my, my home audio. You know, I mean, we're, we're guys. We like Pretty having much, yeah. nice things, nice toys. And uh, especially because I used to use this stuff for work professionally, um, I understand the difference in the, the technology and the performance of a high spec image tube or multiple tubes versus, you know, something that's kind of like, yeah. So um, me, I know that I'm going to want the best that I can afford. Um, $2,000 is eh, kind of mm -hmm. may, maybe during normal times, mm -hmm. uh, we'll say like a year ago um, or even longer. Yeah, you're gonna find stuff two thousand dollars. That's pretty decent. And there, there, there are some image tubes coming in from overseas, like in Europe, that are actually really pretty nice uh, for that price tag. The problem is right now, due to everything else, demand. I gotcha. mean, you know, the the current climate um, between the pandemic, between the riots, and the uh, massively contentious election coming up. People are buying anything and everything in this industry that isn't strapped down. And uh, you're going to be hard pressed to find even, you know, some of the lower end stuff uh, that, that's closer to that $2,000 mark uh -huh. for that price. I mean, you know, nowadays, even buying new stuff, you're probably going to be paying close to what that person uh, paid new for it just because they can get that price. Because lead times for night vision like decent night vision uh -huh. they could be six months plus right now yeah i'm learning that the hard way <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i'm just sitting here twiddling my thumbs waiting um no yeah it, it, i think so i think a lot of people don't realize that there is like an aftermarket or i guess not right now but there is an aftermarket for a use a used market for night vision Absolutely. And, and so with buying used night vision, what are some of the things to look out for? Because, um, you know, like, for instance, I talk to a lot of people who ask me about buying guns used. I think a lot of people tend to have the same mentality about buying used guns as they do cars back in like the early, late 2000, late 1990s. Right. Where, you know, you yep. had to be really cautious about what kind of car you bought used nowadays. Generally speaking, depending on a car you're getting, you, you, you're generally fine. Um, and I feel the same way to a degree with, with firearms. Like, you know, do you generally don't, don't overthink it, right? You know, you find a gun you like, the price you like, and it's used as long as there aren't any like, uh, you know, red alarms or anything like that, red flags. Um, just, you know, you'll be fine. Could you say the same thing about night vision? To a degree, but you really want to make sure that you understand the pedigree of that particular device. Um, every image tube is going to have, uh, that, that's built today, or we'll say in the past uh, 10 years, maybe even go back 15 years, mm -hmm. um, you're going to get a data sheet with that tube. And that data sheet's kind of like a birth certificate for that specific image tube because it's going to give you all the measurable pertinent specs from the manufacturer. 
and it's going to be serialized to that particular image tube. Not necessarily the serial number that's on the device that the tube was installed in, mm -hmm. but that particular tube. So what that, um, what, what that uh, data sheet is going to tell you is, first of all, is it a good tube? When was it made? Uh, but, you know, and those are going to be the tangible things that you can look at. The, you know, the intangibles are going to be how was that device treated by the previous owner? Because basically image intensification tubes, in order to pass the mil spec, a Gen 3 image tube um, per Department of Defense regulations needs to uh, have a minimum 10,000 powered hour lifespan. Now, a lot of the tubes that are made today are going to have well over that, 15 to 20,000 plus hours. Yeah. Um, but in order to be considered mil spec, it's got to have a minimum of 10. Um, now, the only times I've ever seen tubes burned out was basically in military. Um, you know, and that's just because stuff gets issued and reissued and rebuilt and reissued. And, you know, so they're going to run it into the ground. Okay. Um, but, you know, if you're paying a couple thousand dollars uh, or more for something used, you, you want to make sure that that person took care of it. You know, and I know that all the tough guys out there want to sit there and say, oh, it's a tool, you know. Yeah, just throw it on your driveway. It'll be fine. And, you know, that, that's all cool. But um, at the end of the day, I'm not going to take my tools and throw them down the driveway. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've, I've known uh, stuff to, to last and, and work, and I'll trust it because I'm going to buy quality. But I'm not going to purposely go out of my way and abuse something. Um, so especially when I'm the one paying for it. Yeah, so, yeah to, to say uh, the least. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not going to mind a scratch here or a dent there or something mm -hmm. like that, but let's be honest. When you're spending thousands of dollars on something, you're going to be more liable to take care of it. Yeah. And if that tube has had, you know, 9,000 hours of use on it, you know, let's say, uh, you know, it's been used in a lot of training or it's been uh, accidentally left turned on a few times or, you know, things like that, you, you want to trust who you're buying it from. Um, gotcha. so if it was like one of my buddies, sure, mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't hesitate, but if it's someone you don't know, you're really going to want to do some research and maybe talk to other people that they've sold stuff to. Okay. So with that, let's say I got my, I got my night vision, I got my setup. What's the best way to care for it to make sure that it lasts as long as possible um, and that I don't have any issues down the line other than just the natural kind of wear and tear that you get from using it? So I'm a big stickler for taking batteries out of things that I'm not using. Um, I take batteries out of anything expensive, night vision, thermal, lasers, um, even some weapon lights that are on a, a gun that I know, like, I'm not going to shoot this for a while. Yeah. Um, it's going to be in the safe. And, you know, I always recommend using lithium batteries. Uh, lithium isn't going to leak like alkaline does. It's got much better um, uh, regulation over uh, various temperature ranges, extreme heat and extreme cold. Um, but regardless, I don't leave batteries in stuff. Uh, unless it's something that, like, let's say I'm... A, a police officer mm -hmm. and I'm going to be using it nightly, especially now, um, then yeah, I'll maybe change the batteries once a week. And, and yeah, the battery is going to last, you know, longer than that. Um, most devices on a single battery, you're going to get, depending if it's a, a single tube, you're probably going to get, um, you know, 20 uh, to, to 40 hours of life. Um, also, depending on the ambient temperature you're using it in, mm -hmm. uh, with dual tubes, you're probably going to get half that because you have to uh, power, you know, two tubes off the same uh, battery. battery yeah. But um, you know, even so, I don't want my night vision if I'm on a two-way range going out on me, and I don't want to have to stop and be replacing batteries and anything in the middle of a drama. You know, my life is worth more than uh, a three-dollar, <laughs> you know, one-two-three battery or you know, a one-dollar double A. Yeah. So, um, you know, store it in a nice, cool, dry place. Um, don't store it in Pelican cases. Uh, you know, that? That's a big thing. So I see a lot of my students showing up at class with their night vision in Pelican cases. And, you know, I know that the, the Pelican case or Storm case or things like that seem like a great idea. Yeah, store my expensive items I want to protect in them because they're going to be protected. Yeah. But those kinds of cases are for transportation, not storage. 
you know, so that that foam, even with desiccant and things like that, it still will retain moisture. It's open cell. Mm, so, okay. you know, if, if I'm going to be putting something away for maybe a, a couple of weeks or something like that before I use it again, I don't want to, you know, put an expensive electronic device in open cell foam and then seal it. Okay. Gotcha. I never thought about that, actually. That's a pretty good idea. <laughs> well, the same, the same with firearms. You know, I don't mm. want stuff to oxidize or rust or whatever. So, you know, I'll, I'll fly with uh, guns in Pelican cases, obviously. Um, I'll travel, you know, cross country with them in my truck in Pelican cases. But as soon as I get to where I'm going, Thank you me. know, that's, I'm, they're going to come out of the case. Gotcha. So what's the difference between grain and white? I grew up in the era of the green. Uh, I always knew that vision would be green. Um, and then now recently, I'm starting to notice this white phosphorus nonsense. <laughs> so talk yeah. to me about the, the <laughs> distinctions between those two. So the human eye sees the most shades of green out of any color in the visible light spectrum. Uh, we technically see 5,000 more shades of green than we do of red. Red being the least visible color in the visible light spectrum to the human eye. So, you know, way back, in uh, you know the, the 60s, 70s, 80s, as we we're going through Gen 1 and Gen 2 image intensification tubes, kind of the, the common idea in the scientific community developing this stuff was, well, let's make it green because yeah. that's going to give the wearer, the user, the most delineation of uh, the environment that they're trying to look at because they're going to be able to see the most shades. And, you know, that was that was cool but um it wasn't really until the war on terror started um after uh, the towers came down that night vision really got deployed on a lot of people over a long period of time so the gwat was really kind of that that crucible of night vision and not just the technology but the you know the ttps and the sops that the warfighter was using mm -hmm. with night vision so, um, you know, that, that taught us a lot. And uh, up until then, yeah, night vision had been deployed. I mean, the Gulf War, you know, that lasted five minutes, and very few uh, warfighters actually got to fight using night vision. And there were other low-intensity conflicts, um, which I kind of hate that term, but, you know, it because any conflict I've been involved in, I never thought was low-intensity. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, regardless, um, all of these so-called low-intensity conflicts were mainly, um, you know, small special operations units with, you know, a little bit of data here, a little bit of data there collected. Um, but when, you know, your your infantry uh, units as well as your, your soft units started deploying for long periods of time, large scale at night, that's when we started uh, figuring out some of the limitations of the technology. And, um, you know, image intensification devices, they're, they're not magic. Yeah. Um, you know, even the latest, greatest, highest spec image tubes that are going to be supplied to national asset level operators, um, they're still going to require some amount of ambient light because that's what they are. They're image intensification. They amplify existing ambient light. Mm. So if you go out on a night with clear skies, you know, beautiful stars, a half moon or better, um, and maybe even some ambient man-made light from, um, you know, a, a city that's over the horizon or something like that, mm -hmm. and you turn on your night vision, you're going to get a phenomenal image. But two weeks later, when the moon phases have cycled, now let's say maybe it's overcast and you're in an area maybe under heavy tree canopy, um, that same uh, image tube is going to give you a noticeably crappier image. And at that point, you're going to have to start relying on active infrared. So an infrared laser infrared illuminator. And that mm. illuminator, basically picture it like a, an invisible flashlight uh -huh. that can only be seen through night vision. Which, I'm not going to lie to you, the first time I ever saw that, I was like, what? It was <laughs> nutty, yep. man. I was like, okay, now that's cool. Because I would constantly, I think it was when I was hawk, I was hawk hunting at, hawk hunting at yep. night. And so I would like take them off, put them on, take them off, put them on. I'm like, that is crazy. Yeah, where'd the laser go? Yeah. So how does okay? I might be going off subject here. So <laughs> how does that work <laughs> in terms of infrared and and the fact that no one else can see that light but you, but it's still illuminating like that? It just my yeah. So that infrared basically, if if you look at the light spectrum, 
um, we see in the visible light spectrum, which is right here in the middle. Mm -hmm. And above it is ultraviolet. Below it is infrared. And those are going to be in bands that we don't see with the naked eye. Um, some animals can start to see, uh, like birds, for instance, uh -huh. can start to, to see in that little bit of crossover. Um, but uh, uh, mammals in general, um, as well as us humans, we're not going to see in ultraviolet or uh, infrared. So, you know, it's kind of like what mom always would say, like, hey, make sure you're wearing sunscreen just because you can't see Seems it doesn't amazing. mean that's not hurting you. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing with infrared. Just because you can't see those lasers doesn't mean that someone, you know, isn't targeting you to canoe your head. So <laughs> at that point, it's one of those things that um, infrared lasers are generally how you're going to aim while wearing a night vision device. Uh, but the infrared illuminator is like a flashlight. So, you know, you, you got a white light on your defensive uh, rifle mm -hmm. um, that you're going to use to kind of paint the room and, and see what you're looking at and be able to positively identify a, a target as a threat or a non-threat. But the same thing is going to necessarily uh, or, or would necessarily uh, be there for your night vision. And when you start going into some of these darker environments um, where the image intensification tube alone starts struggling, mm -hmm. at that point, you're going to go into using that active infrared. You're going to supplement it with that invisible light. The problem that, um, you know, warfighters started seeing in the, the war on terror is once we start having to chase guys into tunnels, um, into caves, going subterranean, things like that, it gets real dark real quick. And in pitch black pea soup, you're not going to be able to get anything out of that image intensification device. So how are that, they able it, to see? <laughs> what's that? How are they able to see, though? <laughs> the people well, that you're chasing? <laughs> well, in... The, the human eye can do some amazing things adapted, you know, complete darkness. Mm. Um, you know, once uh, we've got all that visual purple in there, um, you know, but uh, uh, once you take that away by shining a light in someone's eyes, it technically takes uh, uh, the human brain, or I should say the eye, about 28 to 20 and a half minutes to regain full natural night vision. So having the... Um, uh, the ability for us to be able to go into these darker environments mm -hmm. um, where it is essentially pitch black um, with our intensification devices, mm -hmm. um, we would start turning on infrared illuminators, but the bad guys could start seeing those too because there's other devices, not necessarily night vision devices, that can pick up infrared. Um, cameras, for example. Um, some of the older cell phones could pick that up. Mm -hmm. And you'd get guys monitoring those kinds of devices because they could figure it out actually um, alarmingly quickly. Yeah. They could start figuring out some, some pretty uh, primitive ways to defeat our technology. Um, they, they would at least know that we're there and they could start implementing, you know, uh, uh, E and E plans for themselves, or uh, they could just start, you know, lobbing grenades down tunnels and things like that. I mean, basically making our lives miserable. So along then comes white phosphor. The idea being that even though green is the most visible color in the uh, visible light spectrum to us, white is going to be the brightest color in the visible light spectrum. So the color is going to help us get a brighter image that's going to last just a little bit longer before we have to go to active infrared to supplement it. But gotcha. it, it's not so much green uh, versus white as it is filmed versus unfilmed tubes. So <laughs> without getting too much into the weeds, basically a thin film, which you're going to see with a lot of uh, night vision tube descriptions, uh -huh. um, thin film is there to basically protect the tube from destroying itself um, and, and allow it to have that full 10,000 minimum powered hours lifespan. But um, at the same time, it's blocking a significant portion of light that is able to then get amplified. So mm. unfilmed image tubes, where you take that film away and they've uh, discovered some new technological advancements that still give the tube that same powered lifespan and still make it just as tough. Uh -huh. um, but now you get full value light coming in. So technically, you could get unfilmed white, unfilmed green, you could get, I mean, they could make the tube essentially any code you want. It could be unfilmed purple. But the biggest difference is between 
filmed and unfilmed technology as far as the leap goes. Gotcha. So you mentioned something about PS, PV, PBS 14, right? Yep. Was there like a PBS 13 and like a 12? And then, is that chronological or is that just um, kind of, it just is the no, name, it just is what it is? It's military designations. Okay. Um, so uh, prior to the PBS 14, um, the predecessor was the PBS 7. Okay. Um, and that was the type of goggle that I'm sure all of your viewers and listeners have seen in movies where there's two eyepieces and then it goes to a, a single tube in, yeah. the, in the front. Yeah. And then before that, was uh, the PBS-5, and that was in the 80s. Um, that basically looked like a brick uh, on your face um, <laughs> with two little eyepieces. It was a binocular-style device. Okay. Um, there's a, a pretty famous picture of a Delta Force operator at Desert One uh, wearing them, um, and if you don't want to dig that up, you can always just watch Ghostbusters uh, because the, the goggle that, uh, that, that Ray wears yeah. is PBS-5. PBS Live, gotcha. So what about the one with the, the, the four, like the weirdo kind of like four tubes, I guess, essentially is what, what what's the deal with so that? That's the GPNVG-18. Uh, it's a panoramic night vision goggle. Okay. So I don't care if you've got a single tube or dual tube goggles. Um, you're going to get a 40 degree field of view. So when you consider that human eyes with both eyes, we get roughly about 160 degree field of view if you hmm. count the peripheral. Um, you know, when you all of a sudden go into this, now you're seeing the world through a toilet paper tube, basically. And your world, again, gets real small. So you have to constantly make sure you're turning your head, looking at everything. I mean, it's exhausting because, you know, you walk into a room or outside during the daytime, you can see a whole lot. You can process a whole lot. And that's really, you know, when, when you're talking about gunfights and fighting in general, it's your ability to process information very, very quickly mm -hmm. and then make the, I don't want to say right or wrong decision, but I'll say the rightist decision mm -hmm. based on the information that you've processed. That's what's going to, you know, separate, you know, your, your operators from, you know, your infantrymen. Um, it, it's that, that, that computer processor in our heads. Um, and, uh, I actually got that from a, a friend of mine um, uh, who has a, uh, uh, a very storied background, um, and he gave a lecture about the processor speed of operators and what, you know, what it makes, or I'm sorry, what it takes to uh, serve in some of these units, and I always thought that was a great way of explaining it. But when your world is 40 degrees in a yeah. toilet paper tube, your processor speed has to slow down. Um, now the, the panoramic goggles give you 97 degrees. Okay. So that allows you to start going a lot faster. So even with the dual tube goggles, um, you know, like current standard issue for SOCOM is the PVS-31 Alpha, and that's a dual tube night vision goggle. So it's going to give both of your eyes the same image, allowing your brain to process everything at the same speed versus a single tube where your brain has to kind of slow down a little bit and be like, okay, so I'm getting the night vision aid in one eye, mm -hmm. but one eye is unaided, so I kind of have to, you know, juxtapose the two and then make a decision. Uh, with dual tubes, you're able to just get it all at the same time, but your brain is going to collimate that into a single 40-degree field of view, whereas the panoramic still is then going to give you the 97 mm -hmm. degrees, gotcha. and that's going to allow you to get a lot more information to be able to process things a lot faster. So if I'm running... A single tube. Um, mm -hmm. Would I run the tube? I'm assuming I'd still be running a laser, of course, um, but I'd only be able to process that information through the whatever eye I have covered. Correct. So some guys, I, yes and no. Okay. <laughs> some some guys are able to do that seamlessly, mm -hmm. and when you work in a PBS 14, like I mean, I've seen dudes be able to drive, you know, a a, a Humvee, you know, flat out. Um, or, I mean, hell, I've seen dudes on uh, dirt bikes under 14s be able to drive them flat out, and it's just they're that good with them. Mm -hmm. um, with me, I've always, and it's just everyone's brain works a little differently. Um, with me, I've always had to kind of um, not close one eye, but kind of scrunch it a little bit just to kind of force uh, my, my eye that's aided with the goggle okay. into, you know, using that. Um, so... 
it, it really is going to depend uh, also on what I, you know, you put a, a monocular on, you know. So for me, uh, I'm right-handed and right-eye dominant. Yeah. And in some cases, I'm going to actually put my monocular on my dominant side if I'm going to stay dark, um, you know, on compromise or uh, if my laser goes down and I'm just going to use the optic on my gun, mm-hmm. I can get that monocular on my, excuse me, on my right side behind my optic very quickly. Uh, whereas my, you know, physiologically, I can't Can't, do this with my left eye behind a red dot. It's just, it ain't going to work. So, um, you know, at at that point though, if I'm going to go white light on compromise or, or if my laser goes down, then my, my dominant eye is now unaided and easier to get behind the red dot. So if I'm wearing it on my, my right side, Uh I'm not going to, have nearly as much thought going into having to like kind of close one eye a little bit because I'm naturally going to favor this eye. Okay. But if it's left, yeah, then I'm to... yeah, I'm going to have to kind of force myself to favor my left. Okay. So when you're shooting, is there a way to shoot night vision with through your red dot? Let's say I just wanted to run just my red dot. I'm going to run any lasers. Is there a way to do that with night vision? Because I look at it and I say that seems kind of hard. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, it's kind of like what's old is new again. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if, if you've got an absolute co-witness height optic on your, on your gun, you're going to be hard-pressed to get your night vision goggle down low enough behind that optic to be able to pick it up. But, you know, we all see all the, the, the high-end um, optic manufacturers making their red dots with night vision settings. And a lot of times if you don't have night vision, you're like, all right, whatever. Yeah. Who cares? But, you know, all of a sudden you have goggles, yeah, being able to go passive is a big deal because night vision has become so prevalent on the battlefield, at home, you know, foreign and domestic. Um, so many people have night vision or at least the ability to detect infrared that going willy-nilly with our, um, you know, lasers and illuminators like we were able to do 20 years ago yeah. uh, when the war started, you just can't do that anymore. And now a lot of emphasis is being put on passive night vision shooting because if you can just get your goggle behind your red dot um, on your on your rifle, uh, at that point, you're not putting anything out there into the ether that can be traced right back to you. So that's why you're starting to see a lot more of the taller mounts uh-huh. out there. there. There's a lot of good ones out there. I mean, you know, shameless plug. Oh, I was going to tell you, stop it. Just say it. <laughs> <laughs> Just say it. But, you know, if, and if you can find any of our stuff right now, because everything, like I said before, is just getting eaten up by the, the customer base, um, great, go for it. But, you know, there's other good mount manufacturers that are making tall mounts, too. Um, but the ability to get your mount up uh, or your optic up a little bit taller um, has more benefits than just, you know, passive night vision shooting. Um, if you're a law enforcement, having a taller mount is going to get you a much faster and easier side picture while wearing a gas mask. Mm. Um, if you're uh, if, if you're wearing a headset like Peltors or Sordens or things like that, um, you know those low mounts, the buttstock wants to knock your uh, your ear pro oh, right off yeah. your ear. Whereas if you have a, a little bit taller mount, you're you're just going to have your ear pro right over the buttstock, no problem. And then once you go from daytime shooting to night uh, night vision shooting passively, there's a seamless transition. Yeah, you're literally doing the exact same thing. Yeah, I, I, the question was loaded because I I ran. I just got done doing Buck's three day uh, recce course in Utah. Yep. And so I stole one of his. Um, I'm, by stealing, meaning he let me borrow it for the course. I just never gave it back. Um, <laughs> so I was running one of his uh, Unity Tactical Risers. Um, and I hated him. I hate you and him for it because I remember I was talking to you and you know I sent you a picture of it and you're like, "Yep, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna fall in love," and I was like, yep. oh, I was like over a riser." <laughs> I was like, um, but then I ran it, and then I didn't realize it's actually because I'm very for people who watch my videos. You can see I hunker down on my gun. I really, yep. especially on the rifle, I really hunker down, and that's just the way I learned to shoot. And you know, because I was always running stuff that was co witness. So for me, that I thought that was natural. Until I use this riser, <laughs> yeah, yeah, using the riser, man, it, it, I didn't realize it, 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 it allows me to kind of maintain, be, be relaxed, um, instead of yep. kind of tense up here, like a little turn. Up. Exactly, it's just up and and we're we're good to go. 
Um, so when you're doing that for hours, uh, after you've, uh, been wearing, you know, a plate carrier and a helmet and a pack all day and you're still wearing it. And now you got, you know, the, you know, bad guys shooting at you. So you're naturally more tense. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've got neck problems and back problems and, you know, things like that, that, uh, some of those, those postures are, are hard for me at this point. You know, it actually is painful to really get, get down, down like yeah. this and do the whole Groucho Marx, you know, kind of uh, shooting style. And having having a riser, uh, it it helps. And, yeah, it, it changes your offset, mm-hmm. um, you know, but as a professional gunfighter, whether you're military, law enforcement, or as a civilian who trains, you know, you know your offset. It's And, and you just train for that. Yeah. Yeah, it just sucks now because now I'm like looking at everything on my guns and I'm like, uh, I want to put a riser on you. I want to put a riser on you. <laughs> Where is it? Right here, put a riser on well, you it, and you and you. <laughs> and so, years, ago, years ago, um, you know, at, at least uh, uh, with my team, what a lot of guys were doing, were, um, you know, we were putting our optics on top of the carry handle and then putting the carry handle whole assembly on top of the the m4 flat top Mm -hmm. and the reason we were doing that way back in the day was because um you know when when you start looking at the gear available at that time um you know you had the uh the plastic m4 hand guards yeah and then you also had like the knights uh ris rails the original you know uh issued m4 quad rail and those things were really only held in place by the spring tension on the delta ring same as the plastic hand guards. And yeah, there, there was like a little piece that kind of wedged in there around the gas tube mm-hmm. that was supposed to keep it all straight, and it didn't keep it straight. <laughs> you know, I mean, in, in real life, that stuff takes so much abuse. Yeah. So, you know, you put your, your PEC 2 or your PAC 4 or whatever laser you had at the time on a, a rail that, you know, this is pre free float rails. Uh, you put that on at that point um, and zero it. That's great, you know, for a minute of bad guy. We'll say out to a hundred meters or so. Yeah. But if I take a high percentage shot, there's no way, you know, I'm going to take a high percentage shot with a, you know, a, a centimeters, millimeters, inches um, that that I had um, with, with that. I mean, because if it if it rotated a little bit uh-huh. one way, you know, a degree yeah, this way, degree that way, it, that could throw it off, and that could be the the difference. So. Um, being able to shoot passively with night vision because night vision was such a, a huge advantage, mm-hmm. still is, obviously. Um, but being able to go passively on something that was much more stable than the laser mounted on uh, uh, a rotational or rotational capable, I guess, handguard uh-huh. was a, a huge benefit. Gotcha. So how far, like generally speaking, if I'm running, if I'm running nods and running a laser realistically how far can i shoot now i'm not talking about clipping on to a rifle but just running nods sure. in a laser how 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 you know realistically how far can i shoot with that particular rifle all right so um that's actually it's a, a really good question and it has multiple variables that are going to depend on it mm-hmm. so according to the united states army asymmetric warfare group um they did a study uh, not too long ago, that basically concluded that with the best ambient light conditions, um, you know, as far as like clear skies, um, uh, you know, stars, half moon or better, yeah. the the best conditions that you're only going to have once a year, uh, <laughs> you're basically with a PBS 14 current generation three image intensification green filmed image tube. Yeah, you're going to have a maximum PID range. That's positive identification. You're going to have a maximum PID range of 176 yards. So mm-hmm. that means that you'd be able to make out, all right, good guy with the gun, bad guy with the gun. Mm-hmm. And I'll, you know, I'll take that shot. Now, like I said, that has a lot of variables that Mother Nature, you know, because she has a big say in this, um, on, on what your performance is going to be out of your device. Yeah. Um, if you have that, great. You're not going to have that, like, ever. So, and especially in the middle of a fight, because there's so much crap flying through the air. I mean, that, that's one of the big things that uh, a lot of people don't realize until they've been in that fight, just how much dust and debris and stuff is flying everywhere. And that 
brings up a bit of a limitation of the the technology because night vision image tubes are not going to see through dust and mm. fog and you know things like that. So you're you know I, I tend to tell most people, especially when I'm training law enforcement, that you're really not going to want to be taking shots at over a hundred yards with a goggle uh, passively or with a goggle and a laser yeah. because you're you're setting yourself up for liability. I mean. You know, whether you're a, a civilian or a law enforcement professional or a warfighter, every bullet you launch has a lawyer attached to it. Yeah. And you have to, you know, you, you have to be able to defend every single one of those shots. So that kind of uh, PID range is really, you know, you, you can start stretching it out there with infrared illuminators uh -huh. to help you. But um, I, I tend to tell most people 100 yards and in. Mm. Um, now, You'll be able to see things way further. Yeah. You know, really speaking, a PVS 14, um, and I know I keep going back to the 14 because it's, <laughs> it is the most ubiquitous goggle out gotcha. there uh, in the United States, uh, whether we're talking civilians, law enforcement, obviously military. Um, a 14 on a good night, you're going to be able to get detection capability out past 800 yards. Now, when I say detection capability, I mean you're going to be able to see a man sized something. Mm hmm moving you know you won't necessarily know is that a man is that uh, a bush is that a you know a vehicle you know what what is it you'll Chupacabra. see some yeah. size but you know once you're, you're gonna have to be able to get up on it before you can really? determine exactly what it is which at that point you have night vision so yeah. you can see in the dark which means you've got that veil that you can you know more safely maneuver yourself closer to a possible target gotcha the um from a country standpoint, like other militaries in different countries, how prevalent is night vision? Do are there, what other countries ha use night vision to the degree Everybody. that we do? Really, <laughs> <laughs> everybody. If, if yeah. you ask a warfighter, you know, beyond his weapon system or her weapon system, um, what's the most important stuff you're taking out in the field? You know, one of the first things they're going to say is night vision. Hmm. You know, being able to see in that in, in the dark is is everything. It's life. Gotcha. The now for the helmet, yep. how, how important is the helmet and why in terms of running night vision? Like, what are some of the things that? And I ask this question because I, as I've started to deep sea dive into it, um, I'm starting to realize certain things, limitations, and so forth um, with respect to the the ancillary items around the actual night vision. Um, kind of yep. talk to me a little bit about those. So, I usually recommend a helmet for most people. Even if you're not, you know, a, a cop or a warfighter, I mean, I, I would talk to hunters who were buying their first night vision device and asking for advice. And they're like, look, I want to go out there and play G.I. Joe. I'm not, you know, trying to LARP or anything like that. Yeah. But I'd still point towards a helmet. Um, now, they don't necessarily need to get a ballistic helmet, but a, uh, a bump helmet like a polymer, a good quality polymer helmet. And there's manufacturers out there that make, you know, for three to four hundred dollars a very good, comfortable, um, and stable helmet platform that you can, you know, throw night vision on and be good all night long. Gotcha. And the reason I say a helmet is because it's rigid and you're now going to cantilever uh, weight off the front of your face. And we're not used to that. And it puts a lot of strain on our neck, on our shoulders, on our back that we don't necessarily recognize right up front. Yeah. But if you're not, you know, if, if you're not used to doing physical activities, um, and uh, what's more, now you're going to add weight that's going to be wanting to pull things forward on your head. Uh, over the course of maybe an hour, you're going to start feeling it. And by the third hour being out there, you're going to start hating life. <laughs> so, um, you know, having... Even a PBS-14, which is just a monocular, yeah. weighs about 12 and a half ounces with a battery in it. Now, 12 and a half ounces isn't all that much. You know, you consider the panoramic goggles you were asking about before mm -hmm. weigh roughly 28 to 29 ounces. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, that's that's when you start seeing some of these operators with, like, the volcano necks because <laughs> uh, you, you start building muscle on top of yeah. muscle. But uh, at the end of the day, that helmet is going to help um, kind of spread that weight over more of your head rather than just on, on, on the front. Like the, the skull crusher that gets issued with the PBS-14 yeah. is 
absolute piece of shit. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know anyone who has ever used that past, you know, uh, basic training yeah. past, uh, you know, maybe the nineties. It looks cool. Uh, uh, but you know, there, there are other things out there like uh, cry precision makes the nightcap. Uh-huh. Um, uh, ops core makes a, a skull, uh, a skull mount. And um, uh, let's see. Uh, Raptor makes uh, the, the Sentinel, uh, which is actually really nice. I mean, there, there's, uh, you know, first spear makes stuff, a lot of good non helmet, uh, mounts out there, but there are four certain roles like recce or non-permissive environments where gotcha. you don't, you, you don't have that volume, uh, in your pack to carry a helmet with you. Mm. Um, or, you know, you're in maybe quasi civilian clothes or something like that. And you can take like a cry nightcap and kind of wad it up and shove it in a, a pocket and, you know, walk out of the building. Go, yeah. um, but a helmet, a bump helmet at the very least is really the way to go. Okay. All right. Well, I'm glad I got my bump helmet and I don't have my skull crush. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think so. I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other questions that people might have. Uh, where do you start to get the... Where do you start to see diminishing returns in terms of pricing? In terms of, okay, I'm like, let's say I have a boatload of cash, and I'm like, give me the best you got. Um, where, where, does that, where does that start to happen in terms of, all right, I mean, yeah, you could get this, but, I mean, I'm not really doing anything much for you. You're not going to reach that. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I, I I, I love to tell you that, oh, yeah, you know, you can really get this capability, yeah. out, out, you know, a cheaper device. But in reality, I mean, most guys are going to start out getting a monocular. Uh-huh. Um, it's going to be, you know, where they're going to get their feet wet with night vision. And then they're going to get bit by that bug and they're going to realize seeing in the dark is cool. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of people have put off buying night vision or um, any sort of seeing the dark technology because, you know, they're, they're like, ah, oh, when am I going to need that? I mean, it's so expensive. And meanwhile, they've got a safe that has, you know, 20 ARs, 15 <laughs> pistols. You know, they all have red dots uh, from yep. Point and EOTech and scopes from <laughs> Loophold and Vortex. And, you know, they've got silencers and all this shit. I mean, they, they could sit there and outfit a platoon, you know, from their private collection. I'm laughing because it's me. In the dark. <laughs> Does it sound familiar? <laughs> but if you can't see in the dark, you're useless half the time yeah. because it's dark out the other yeah. half. Yeah. So, you know, it's one of those things that um, there most guys are going to get started out with a, uh, a PVS-14 um, of some sort. Yeah. Um, they're going to buy a laser, um, you know, an, an infrared laser uh, that uh, like a, a class one device. Um, they're going to buy a helmet or a head mount of some sort. Um, and then hopefully they're going to go out and get some training yeah. because, um, you know, to quote, uh, one of my mentors, um, uh, a man named Pat Rogers, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Uh, he was very fond of saying just cause you have a guitar doesn't make you Jimi Hendrix. So, you know, the same is with your, your firearms, with your technology, anything you've got, if you're not trained on how to properly implement it, you know, you're going to be a liability, not just to yourself, but to your mates, to your family, you know, whatever. Yeah. So, you know, but beyond that, once they get bit by the night vision bug, a lot of guys then say, okay, now I want dual tubes uh, because dual tubes making, you know, life easier in that your both eyes are going to process the same image at the same time, at the same rate, and allow you to move faster and negotiate obstacles and, uh, and carry out tasks faster um, they're going to go and say, so do I just get another PBS-14 and get one of those bridges and put the two together, mm-hmm. or do I buy a purpose-built uh, dual tube? You know, and, and what I tell most guys is, look, you, know, you, you got that PBS-14, you could probably sell it for a decent amount yeah. and take that money and put it towards a mm-hmm. dual tube. You know, if you're law enforcement and you've been issued PBS-14s and now you start moving to dual tubes, yeah, go ahead, buy those bridges, you know, buy the box load, because at that point, you can take all those other 14s that you've had and start making duels out of them. Gotcha. Okay. So, you know, at, 
it, there's always some other level to move up to. Same. And, you know, then once you've got the dual tubes, then you start looking at thermal, you know, and, and lasers. I mean, lasers are a big thing, too. Oh, um, man. Yeah. So, I was like, hey, hey, Chip, I just want to get some nods. That'll be good. And then you're like, yeah, okay, you got the helmet, and then you got the, yep. the mount, and then you got the lasers. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the laser so, is a whole other game. When, when it comes to the lasers, I mean, that's always going to be your default primary aiming system. Yeah. You know, and, and you can do a lot with lasers because the laser is zeroed on the weapon, um, the same as your optics. So uh, once you know your, your offsets and things like that, um, you know, I mean, technically you can shoot from the hip accurately, very accurately with a laser because it's playing the video game at that point. Yeah. You're just tracking that laser through your goggle. You don't have to shoulder the weapon. Even. Um, I recommend it because you're <laughs> going to be able to have more mass behind the weapon for yeah. follow-up shots and things like that. But uh, regardless, you know, lasers, that starts getting pricey too. I mean, you're going to find stuff that's uh, anywhere from uh, four, you know, three or four hundred dollars on up to damn near three thousand yeah. dollars, and it all depends on what capability you're paying for. Yeah, my, so, my and what heard a the bit. FDA allows you to get. Yeah. Okay. So let's speak on that for a little bit. What type of restrictions does the FDA place on lasers? Because I think a lot of people think that lasers are just kind of these innocuous little things that you know don't don't really do much and are kind of harmless. Um, right. What are some of the, what are some of those restrictions and why? <laughs> So um, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is the governing body for lasers. And that's because most lasers, well, all lasers, fall under essentially medical device purview. So um, according to the FDA, in order to be eye safe, and I'm going to use that term lightly because yeah. I still wouldn't take an eye safe laser and have it you know, shined in my eyes. But um, in, in order to be eye safe for infrared lasers, um, it has to be under one milliwatt of measurable output. So uh, milliwatts are going to be the unit of measurement for lasers, um, mm. and it's going to you know, reference the, the wavelength of, of that laser. Uh, but in the infrared spectrum, because we don't see it, it's invisible to our eyes, so our brain doesn't have any uh, warm, like, you know, hey, danger, close your eyes, yeah. look away, or something like that. Yeah. Under one milliwatt is where it's at. And for a focused uh, divergence of that beam for a pointer, like a, a laser aiming pointer, that's fine. You know, it's going to get you out a little over 100 yards. And, you know, for, for most applications, you're going to be just fine. Yeah. But where that starts to come apart is with the illuminator. So the illuminator is, uh, you know, at, at that point, it, it's a, a conical shaped beam, just like a flashlight. So, um, you know, those tend to start getting pretty anemic uh -huh. um, at uh, uh, usable distances because under one milliwatt, I mean, the, the actual emitter on most class one lasers is going to be three or four milliwatts. But at the conical uh, uh, shape of the beam that actually comes out, any point of measurement within that cone mm -hmm. is going to register at under one milliwatt due to uh, how it's diffused. So, you know, at that point, you're getting, I mean, honestly, less than 100 yards of usable output. Gotcha. And uh, even up close, it's not really doing you any favors. Okay. So, you know, the new thing is uh, Vixel lasers. Mm -hmm. And Vixel lasers are one of those things that um, are able to put out a, uh, a lot more usable output. Um, like in all reality, uh, uh, like the B.E. Myers Mall Class yeah. 1 Plus is kind of king of the hill for over-the-counter available uh, Class 1 lasers right now. It's also like $2,700 or $2,800. Oh, I know. <laughs> but, um, that illuminator is going to reach out, you know, yeah. 800 yards. I mean, you're, you're going to get some real usable, in, in my opinion, it's the only duty-ready, over-the-counter available laser. Like, I, I would have no problems um, recommending that to law enforcement officers whose departments don't provide them lasers. Gotcha. Or, okay. you know, it, 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 for civilians, I mean, you, you want to have a, a laser and illuminator that's going to actually get out there. And uh, Vixel lasers allow you to do it and still be considered class one. Um, so, 
you know, a lot of us have, have wondered, like, how are they even getting away with that? But, you know, it, it works. And, uh, and, and it's 100% legal. Yeah. So, you know, again, you have to pay to play. But um, it's uh, mo- most people, once they see uh, a class one Vixel laser mm-hmm. next to a standard class one laser illuminator, it's like, all right, it's, it's all- yeah, at that point, that, that's the best sales pitch for it right there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, Chip, I thank you very much for taking your time out to kind of talk to me about all things night vision. Um, um, thank you. I, I've already fell down the rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> the guys, people start to see that with my content here soon. Um, but um, but no, we really appreciate it, man. Um, we look forward to having you back on to, to delve even deeper into this because, I mean, clearly you know your stuff. Um, and, and I really appreciate you kind of giving us the, the 101 lesson about night vision and um, i'm pretty sure i'm gonna have a trillion more questions and hopefully i can t- turn those questions into videos for people and um have you answered them absolutely my pleasure i appreciate the opportunity to come on your show absolutely man thanks a lot chip thank you Colin. Right. right now there's a culture war against the second amendment which is why i need your help spreading our message to counter their message you can help do this by leaving a comment sharing this video and clicking the bell and subscribe button Let my voice be your voice and let them know you want to keep America tactical because the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed wasn't a suggestion. It was a directive. Also, if you're wondering where to purchase your AR-15s are essential, I will not comply. I am the militia. I lost all my guns in a boating accident and your state specific Keep America tactical shirt. Click the link next to my head or the link in the description section, or if you're watching this on a mobile device, tap the small triangle on the lower right hand side of this video and click the link in the description.